Welcome everyone to the first journal club for the UW Pre-Physician Scientist Club. Um, we're going to be discussing a paper called The Proximal Origin of SARS-CoV-2. It's one of the most cited papers in the industry right now. Um, right now it only, uh, this is an old uh, screenshot. Right now it has like over 500 citations. I presented this originally in like uh, May. Um, make sure to follow us on our Facebook group and our Instagram group. Um, we also have some uh, group me and uh, a Slack channel. So real quick, some introductions. Here are our uh, journal club chairs, um, Deborah Chang and Sunny Howe. Um, I'm Daniel Brock. Right now I'm currently a postback doing some gap years at the National Eye Institute at the NIH. Um, I went to the University of Washington. I graduated with a biochemistry degree in 2019. And this brings me on to an important point. Um, club leaders, um, please send over a picture or a fun fact. We'll like make a poll. Um, but I want to make a club leadership picture and introduce everyone now that we got uh, the leadership more finalized. Um, real quick. Um, I got asked this at the last meeting, why did I make this club? Um, and as an undergrad at UW, I learned very little about physician scientist careers um, or careers that incorporated both science and medicine, which is kind of odd because if you think about it, UW has a massive pre-med community and a massive research community, but little information is available for people interested in pursuing both those aspects. Um, and this could be reflected in uh, UW's matriculate list to MD-PhD programs. While MD-PhD isn't the only way to do a physician scientist career, it's a good metric, and I'm biased towards it. Um, UW is all the way down here, 22 applicants from 2015 to 2019. And if you compare this to other big public schools like University of California, LA, UCLA, and uh, Berkeley, as well as Michigan, we get beat out by like fourfold. There's no reason for that. Um, so this club is designed to get you familiar with physics and scientist careers. This includes journal clubs like this, career networking, and scholarship planning, and some more stuff that we're still talking about. This is the overall schedule for how this journal club is going to go. First, we're going to go over what animals carry coronaviruses because this did not arise naturally in humans. Originally, it was carried by an animal that transferred over to a human. Then we're going to go over how that infected animal ended up infecting a human. Then we're going to connect the dots and say, how did we go from a virus carried by bats primarily to a worldwide pandemic? Um, so real quick, what animals carry coronaviruses? Um, a lot of bats carry coronaviruses. Um, for some history, um, bats transferred uh, coronaviruses to civet cats and started the original SARS-CoV um, virus back in like 2003, 2000, 2004, and then that transferred into humans. Um, this was also uh, a Chinese virus. Um, they were eating civet cats in China, and it transferred over to humans in a Chinese food market, um, similar to how SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 started. Um, also, um, bats transferred it to camels, and then camels started the MERS-CoV, which uh, transferred it to humans in the MERS pandemic. Um, right here, this question mark, symbolizes the hypothesized uh, intermediate species for SARS-CoV-2, which is a pangolin. And if you don't know what that is, we'll cover it. But real quick, some vocab. We're going to go over something called zoonosis and spillover. So zoonosis is the spread of diseases from animals to humans. And this is nothing new. It's happened throughout human history. For example, the bubonic plague, you have rats and stuff spreading the bubonic plague and killing half the planet. Um, also, 
if the disease passes certain criteria, it can be capable of spilling over from animals into humans and causing a pandemic. But it does have to pass certain criteria. Not all viruses can infect humans. First, you have to have contact between animals and humans. So things like slaughter or biting, um, stuff like that could get us exposed to the animals that carry the virus. And then um, host susceptibility right here is basically our immune system. Um, this includes the innate immune system like our skin, our stomach acid, stuff like that. And our uh, more uh, innate responses like macrophages and other parts of the immune system, adaptive immune system, that was the word I was looking for, um, that help defend against viruses. So first you need to be in contact, then you need to be uh, uh, susceptible to being infected. Um, real quick about the history of bats. So if you look up coronavirus research, um, bats are a coronavirus reservoir. That's what they're called. And that's because uh, bats had an evolutionary arms race that evolved alongside coronaviruses. There's an entire family of coronaviruses with hundreds of them. And uh, the bat immune system allows them to be infected and spread the virus without being lethally killed by the virus, unlike in other species like us. Um, historically, bats have spread coronaviruses to intermediate animal species, like with the original SARS-CoV, with cats, and MERS with camels, um, and crowded food markets and farms. Bat caves are a prime spot for viral spillover because they bring humans into contact with animals that carry coronaviruses. Um, real quick, if you're sensitive to seeing lots of dead animals, you might want to look away. What I did was Google Chinese food market, and this is what you find. So right here, there's a lot of dead bats in close contact with people. And right here, you have a lot of dead rabbits and pangolins and a whole bunch of other species. Um, and this is an important thing to talk about because in our culture, in the US, this would be seen as unsanitary. If you were to show, if you were to have something like this happen in the United States, you would have like the police called. Um, however, in China and several other countries, this is culture for them. This is just normal. Um, so there is a cultural difference between how food is prepared in the United States and how it is prepared in countries like China. Um, real quick, we're going to go over what is a pangolin. I had no idea what they were. So here's a video. It's this scaly, anteater-like mammal. Look at this. It looks like something out of Star Wars more than something that you'd find on Earth. Um, but it's this really unique creature, and they're endangered. Um, we're going to go more into that. So they're scaled anteater mammals. They're endangered, but the Chinese uh, still uh, traffic them. Um, and technically, they're illegal to hunt and traffic, but the Chinese government is lax on that. They've let a lot of that through, and I'll show you some images of that. Um, their meat is sold for food, and their scales are still sold in traditional Chinese medicine, where they're marketed as good luck or good health. Again. Another warning, lots of dead animals. Um, so right here, there are piles and piles of dead pangolins. And right here, um, you have bags of their scales. That, like These are hundreds of pangolins worth of scales right here. And they're being marketed right next to a pile of ivory horns from elephants. Um, and this is still common in traditional medicine. So, Next up, we have some questions. I'm gonna ask you some ethical questions and you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an, like super knowledgeable about coronavirus. I'm not, I just like reading about it. Um, so do scientists have the right to tell people what they can and can't eat? 
Should there be a ban on traditional medicine that relies on hunting endangered and potentially disease-carrying animals? And should the government uh, punish poachers? Feel free to discuss. Um, you're encouraged to talk and give your opinion on these. Anyone? I have a clarifying question for the first one. Oh, yes. Sorry. Um, is like, is it asking for like ethics or because it's, it's like a common dis disease spreader? Like, is there a specific reason why scientists tell people what they can and cannot eat? Yeah, this, um, this borders along the lines of an ethical question. Um, for example, if we discover a, uh, a disease carried in cows, which are eaten in America, do, do our scientists have the right to tell us to stop eating cows? Do the scientists have the yes, right I, to do that? I'd say they have the right to tell us, but they can't, or they can't because uh, scientists have no, or governmental or executive power, they can't uh, implement that in any way, but they have uh, almost duty to tell the public when something is dangerous or uh, self will self will cause harm to the greater uh, ecosystem. I also think it, I agree with that. I also think it's important to at least take into deep consideration of what scientists are telling us um, just because like they have knowledge and experience and that there should be at least some sort of consideration um, to kind of like, uh, I guess like honor it sort of and be thoughtful and mindful about it. Yeah, I also think that people will have the right to know like if they're like the food they're eating is like disease carrying, like at least it's good to know for them. For sure. Anyone want to answer the next two questions about traditional medicine and poaching? Personally, I think that there should be stricter bans on hunting endangered animals because, I mean, you've seen it all throughout the world. We uh, hunt animals to extinction, and this could cause major uh, damage to the ecosystem. Um, and to add on that, if they're potentially disease carrying like pangolin, um, I think there's a real risk towards uh, hunting these endangered species for traditional medicine. So maybe we do need to crack down more on poaching. Anyone else want to give their opinion? Just adding on to that, I also think that not only do you need to implement like law, you also have to have some sort of enforcement for it too, or else it's like you have a law, but no one's really like checking to see if you're following it or not. Yeah, that's what happens in China. They have laws, but uh, the government does not enforce strict poaching laws. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll move on to the next section. Um. So again, um, in order to infect humans, uh, SARS-CoV-2 needs to be able to, uh, in, to bind to a human receptor and enter our cells. If it wasn't capable of this, then we wouldn't be talking right now because there would be no pandemic. Um, so this is a quick diagram I found. SARS-CoV-2 binds to this protein on the surface of lung epithelial cells called ACE2. And by binding, it mediates viral to cell fusion. And that's how our cells are infected by coronavirus. And I just thought it was interesting because this ACE2 just isn't around for nothing. It's a part of the angiotensin processing pathway that regulates blood pressure. And I just thought it was interesting because if you look at one of the major risk factors for COVID, it's high blood pressure. Um, but yeah, ACE2 is uh, involved in angiotensin processing, and it's uh, expressed in the lungs as well as some other tissues. Here is a quick diagram of the coronavirus structure. 
we're going to be focusing a lot on these spike proteins. Those are these region on, regions on the surface of the virus. Here's like a diagram of it. And here's a more detailed diagram. They found out that it has in a closed and an open position. And by doing this, by kind of opening and closing, it can mediate a viral entry into the cell. And just to give you some interesting background about what's going on in UW, this structure was determined at UW by someone named uh, Lexi Walls. She is a great graduate student. I think she actually got her PhD this year. Um, but if you want to read a really interesting computational biology paper where they determine the structure of the spike proteins, I would highly recommend this. Everything is hyperlinked. And uh, if you just click this, it'll take you to the paper. And these slides will be given to everyone. Um, if someone wants to present this paper, I think it's awesome. It has like over a thousand citations. Um, Lexi has really jump-started her career with this. I think it'd be really cool for us to share this on our Instagram or yeah. like Facebook and kind of like represent UW and stuff. Of course. Like this is one of the most cited papers in coronavirus research as a whole because it's being used in vaccine development. Um, the spike protein um, is a, a target by the immune system, so we could make antibodies against it. Um, I absolutely agree that we should share this to communicate uh, some interesting labs. Maybe uh, one of you could research, uh, reach out to the lab that was responsible for publishing this and get involved with it. Um, that'd be really cool. And here's what people are accustomed to seeing on the news. Um, this big, ugly virus. Um, this is just a schematic to show the heterogeneity of the spike protein. So real quick, the spike protein or the receptor binding domain has a ton of heterogeneity and it's uh, called hypermutable. What hypermutable means is that uh, it has a very fast rate of mutation and therefore a very fast rate of evolution. Um, here are two of the main uh, coronavirus genuses. Um, there's the alpha genus and the beta genus. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the beta genus right here. And they bind to different uh, receptors depending on their sequence. Um, SARS-CoV-2 binds to ACE2. The original SARS also binds to ACE2. But MERS, it binds to something called DPP4. I don't know what that is. Um, and there also are other coronaviruses which bind sugars. It's not always a protein. And this all allows them to gain entry into our cells and infect us. Um, and just to let you know, this is a dramatic underrepresentation of the heterogeneity in coronaviruses. There are hundreds of coronaviruses out in the wild, and many of them are still undiscovered. This is just a simplification. We're going to go over the spike proteins. Um, so within the protein, there are six crucial amino acids. So proteins are made out of amino acids. Amino acids can bind and uh, mediate that entry into our cells. Um, and there are six of them in the spike protein for SARS-CoV-2 that bind strongly to human ACE2 receptors in the lungs. Without these six crucial amino acids, again, we probably won't be talking because there would be no pandemic. Here is a representation of that. So in green is the human ACE2 receptor, and in pink is the SARS-CoV-2 uh, receptor binding domain or spike protein. And highlighted are some important amino acids we're going to be going over the six that are crucial for binding. If you're planning on going to med school, you're going to have to have all of this memorized. And I understand that uh, not everyone has them memorized yet, but you definitely will have to memorize them for the MCAT. So for people in biochemistry, I know there's a lot of biochemistry here. Um, before we get into this, I see that Vicky has her hand raised. Do you want to answer, uh, ask a question? 
Yeah, I was wondering if ACE2 receptor is only presented on like like alveoli cells or or like is it present in the, like on other part, body parts? It is not only present in the lungs. There are other um, cells in the body that express it. Um, I can't give you a list because I don't know it off the top of my head, but uh, it's predominantly expressed in the lungs and that's how coronavirus gets entry but it's not solely um, in the lungs. And that's, I've read some research that uh, perhaps SARS-CoV-2 may infect other cells in the body. And that's why uh, some people are having these weird adverse effects um, even after getting infected. Um, but yeah, that's some interesting research. Um, the most of the research is done in the lungs though, because that's how it primarily infects humans. Is That's it because, question. like, is it because the lung is like the first, like, line of contact, like the virus will have, or is it like other reasons, or, um, do, or do we know yet? We do know that this virus is spread primarily airborne. So by talking, by, by simply talking, you can spread a lot of particulates in the air, um, droplets. Um, that's why you wear a mask. Um, mask wearing reduces the droplet formation and uh, social distancing um, decreases the likelihood of the droplets reaching your lung membranes. Um, previously, we thought that it was spread through surfaces. So, and it still can. If you touch something and then rub your face, um, you can still get it. Um, but it is spread via airborne predominantly. Um, so people breathing it in, and usually that's mostly because people talk to people or sneeze in front of someone, cough in front of someone, and they breathe in those droplets, and then those droplets get in the lungs and infect your cells. Does that answer your question? Yes. I assume yes. Um, hopefully. Um, so back to the spike protein. Um, we're going to go over the six crucial amino acids that are required for ACE2 binding to the human ACE2 receptor. Um, does anyone want to give the full name for L? So the 455 is the sequence number, the 455th amino acid in the spike protein. L is a symbol for an amino acid. Does anyone want to? Yes, leucine. What's this? F. Final element. Someone's in biochemistry, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Q, I always forget this one. Uh, I forget that as well. It's glutamine. I always remember it as like Q to mean. Um, S. Yes. N is another hard one. Aspiration. Yes. And this isn't pictured here, but Y. Tryptophan. Oh, Ty tyrosine. Yeah, Sorry. tyrosine. <laughs> tryptophan is W. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But they're both those aromatic amino acids. If this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry, you'll learn it eventually if you plan on going to med school. You'll have a whole amino acid list and you'll draw them all out and you'll memorize them and it's a pain. But uh, really, if you're into biochemistry or proteins, you have to know your amino acids by heart. Um, you'll memorize them eventually, don't worry. It's fun. <laughs> um, so question time again. Why do viruses mutate so fast? So viruses mutate a lot faster than humans do. Um, and what happens if we mutate one of the critical amino acids in the receptor binding domain? And lastly, what can we do against a fast evolving virus? That's something that we're still fighting. Um, again, feel free to give your uh, opinion. Um, everyone is welcome to speak.
Um, I guess I don't have like the most concrete answer, but regarding like the last question, um, I did a little bit of research on like the flu virus for this one like project for class. And um, like every year for the flu, we never have a vaccine that's specific to that strain of flu virus every year, but we use the one that we like the most recent one um, in hopes that it's uh, similar enough for you to uh, build an Im immunity to it. Um, yeah, that's like pretty much all I know, but uh, maybe that helps start a discussion. Yeah, I think um, the reason why the viruses mutate so fast is like, it basically is just a strand of like DNA or RNA and like shelled, maybe shelled with like protein, some protein structure. So it's basically pretty basic and like small. So they die really fast and they like, like born really fast. So yeah. it's pretty easy like to make a mistake in their like, DNA or RNA as they like being born and death, like die like constantly. That's a good point because the viral life cycle is exponentially faster than ours. Um, you could have viruses multiply tenfold or more in one day. Um, and also it does, it happens to do with uh, the biochemistry of the viral RNA polymerase. So the coronavirus has a RNA polymerase. And usually, like in our DNA polymerase, we have something called proofreading. That means if the DNA polymerase detects a mistake, if it enters in the wrong nucleotide, it will go back, remove it, and enter in the correct one. And it's pretty good at this. The error rate for eukaryotic DNA polymerase is very low. But viruses, they don't care. There's no proofreading in the coronavirus polymerase. So you could get errors all over and that's to the virus advantage because you get a lot of evolution and you get a lot of uh, different mutations. I have a question about like the polymerase since yes. like uh, is a polymerase from the like virus yes. they, they, oh so it's not the host polymerase? No. Um, it is not a eukaryotic RNA polymerase. Um, our RNA polymerase is located in the nucleus, and it's pretty dang good at uh, transcribing genes. Um, doesn't make too many mistakes. But a, a common trend that you'll see is that uh, in viruses or bacteria, um, the polymerase will lack proofreading. So it's not as advanced. And again, this works to the virus's favor because it, I mean, to a virus, maintaining the exact same code throughout generations isn't very important. In fact, it might be a mistake for the virus because then animals could get immunity really fast and the virus could die out. And viruses, while they aren't technically, well, they're not technically alive, but they do follow the rules of evolution, survival of the fittest. So if you have a high mutation rate and animals can never evolve immunity to you and you just keep spreading, that works to the virus's favor. And having a, uh, a polymerase that doesn't proofread and enters in all these mutations and misreads is uh, a really big factor to uh, how viruses mutate very fast. Should we move on? All right. Moving on. So what people, what this paper has determined is that two crucial events occurred in the evolution of SARS-CoV-2. That's what affects humans. Um, one of them is the evolution of a receptor binding domain, the spike protein, with all six crucial amino acids critical for binding to human ACE2. So I see the number six and I immediately think coronavirus copied, you know who, gathering all six crucial amino acids 
Any Marvel fans here? I'm a huge Marvel nerd. Um, the second is the evolution of a novel polybasic furin cleavage site. And if you don't know what that means, we'll go over it. Um, and it's between two subunits of the spike protein. And this is what's worrying. This second part is new. This first part we can detect in other animals. But this second one is, it seems unique to humans. Um, and it's not been found entirely in other species. So this is the money slide right here, probably the most important slide. It's looking at the coronavirus genome. We're going to be focusing on the spike protein right here because that's how, you know, viruses evolve. It's mainly through these spike proteins, the hypermutable part of the genomes. There is the S1 subunit and the S2 subunit. Real briefly, the S1 subunit contains the receptor binding domain, and that's responsible for binding to ACE2. The S2 subunit is responsible for mediating viral fusion with the cell once the first subunit binds. Um, real quick, we're going to go over the receptor binding domains. I know this is hard to see, so let me zoom in. So these boxes represent similarities found between the human SARS-CoV-2 up here and other coronaviruses found in animals. If the box is uh, <laughs> boxed, then that means they share the same amino acid sequence. For example, this leucine found in human SARS-CoV-2 is shared in bat and pangolin coronaviruses. However, if we look over here toward the other uh, crucial amino acids, we can see that the one found in bats this is the closest bat relative that we found so far. We can see that it's missing. It's missing um, five out of the six crucial amino acids necessary for human ACE2 binding. Meanwhile, if you look at pangolin right here, I'm sorry I'm zooming out all the time. Um, if you look at pangolin, it has all six crucial amino acids necessary for human ACE2 binding. And this is worrying because that means that this pangolin virus could potentially infect our cells. Um, and we're going to go over to the S2 subunit next. Um, and I pointed this out. The pangolin receptor binding domain contains 99% homology with the human SARS-CoV-2 uh, receptor binding domain. The entire... Uh, genome of the virus found in pangolin is a little bit different, but for the receptor binding domain, it's very similar to the one found in humans. Um, also, this is found in between like the S1 and S2 subunit, and it's called the polybasic cleavage site. And this is what is novel about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, if you look at the first row, this is what's found in human. Um, and look at this sequence right here. It's not found in bat. It's not found in pangolin. And at the time when I did this uh, research, um, human SARS-CoV-2 was the only one that had the polybasic cleavage site. And people don't know entirely what it does. Um, but it, um, there are some hypotheses. And uh, some people say that it mediates uh, spike protein cleavage, which may make the virus more aggressive and pathogenic. Um, but it is a hot debate um, describing where this came from. And we'll go into it a little bit more in the next slide. So I presented this presentation like in uh, May, but a few months ago, like I think in July, a new paper came out with more sequences from other species, and they found another one. I'm going to ignore this top part of the graph. It's just the receptor binding domain. I'm going to be focusing on the polybasic cleavage site. They found something in bats, this one right here, that slightly resembles the polybasic cleavage site found in humans. It has two out of the four um, amino acids that are found in uh, SARS-CoV-2 human polybasic cleavage sites. 
Um, and it just goes to show you that maybe we're not uh, out there sequencing everything. Maybe we've missed something. Um, but yeah, as new research comes in, I assume that we're going to find stuff that's similar to the human co uh, COVID-19 COVID um, virus. But what is a little bit alarming, pay attention to this uh, bat virus right here. While it does have a similar polybasic cleavage site, if you go up here to the receptor binding domain and look over here, this is it. It has none of the receptor binding domain. Uh, well, it has one. It has the tyrosine right here. But five out of six of the crucial amino acids are missing. Um, so you could probably see that certain viruses kind of could be get, uh, pieced together in a way that we could uh, find out the sequence of SARS-CoV-2. And that definitely is a, uh, a hypothesis. People hypothesize that uh, there was a viral recombination event that may have uh, arose and started the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. So uh, real quick, it is possible for a cell to be infected simultaneously by two different viruses. And the viruses both infect a cell. And once that happens, um, the viral genome is pretty unstable as we've covered. And you could get fusion of the viral genome and it could create a new virus. That's how people hypothesize that we see something with a novel polybasic cleavage site as well as something with all six um, amino acids critical in the receptor binding domain. Um, so you could kind of piece uh, viruses together in this way with viral recombination. Um, so here are the two scientifically supported mechanisms of evolution that they hypothesized. Um, there's a bat reservoir of coronaviruses. That's the origin point um, that we're pretty sure of. Um, we found a 96% match in bats. Um, the first step would be natural selection for a human ACE2 binding and polybasic cleavage site containing uh, virus in a pangolin. So you get uh, two of those steps evolving in the pangolin and then it transferring over to humans and starting the pandemic simultaneously. Another option is you only have natural selection for human ACE2 binding in the pangolin. We know that pangolins can carry all the uh, amino acids required for ACE2 binding, and then it could transfer over to humans. And then there might be a period of unrecognized human transmission um, where people could catch the virus and not exactly know they have it because it might just be um, less pathogenic. It could be People will wipe it off as like a cold or the flu. Um, but then inside humans, you could have natural selection of the polybasic cleavage site. And once that happens, you get a more aggressive uh, virus that results in the pandemic. Um, these are the two scientifically supported uh, hypotheses. We're going to go over one more just because it's common to hear on the news. Was SARS-CoV-2 designed in a lab. So this might sound crazy, but credit where credit's due. There have been reported cases of lab, of lab escapes of SARS-CoV, the original SARS in 2003. This paper covers that. Um, it was basically a laboratory technician that was working in a uh, research lab and he got infected with SARS-CoV. Um, however, it was contained like uh, people quarantined, the hospital workers quarantined, and it was uh, contained. Um, I believe this occurred in Singapore, and it did not go far. Because usually labs have better sanitation and safety measurements than a food market. Um, also, for evidence against this, the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was not recorded in any lab before the outbreak. So I believe in January of this year, uh, China sequenced the SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral genome for the first time and published it to the world. 
um, and it was not recorded in any lab before that. Um, and this is just a quick picture of my personal hero, Dr. Fauci. He is um, getting geared up. I believe this was during the Ebola pandemic. Um, and it just goes to show you that in labs and in hospitals, you generally have PPE and safety. Um, and even though there might be a small chance of a lab escape, the sequence and all of that point to something evolving in the wild and transferring into a food market. Think about it. Um, a food market where people come into contact with these animals with no PPE, and we know these viruses can be carried by animals, has a much greater chance of infecting humans than someone looking like this. Um, like Dr. Fauci right here is pretty geared up. Um, but people suggest that the new polybasic cleavage site is new and therefore it must have been designed by humans. So let's go further. Um, first of all, the, the human man-made SARS-CoV-2 is not supported at all. Um, there's no evidence of genetic engineering with a known viral backbone. So it's known that humans can make viruses. Um, I worked with a lentivirus in the past and you can look it up. Here is an adenovirus that we've modified for our own use. And real quick, if something is human made, it will have the genetic signatures of being human made. For example, right here, you have a cluster of restriction enzyme cut sites. And that is placed there on purpose so that uh, humans can apply a restriction enzyme and uh, uh, ligate a gene of interest into the viral genome. Also, there's something right here called AMP-R. This stands for ampicillin resistance, and it is for selection of virally transduced cells in a dish in a lab. Um, and both of these things are not likely to occur in the wild. You would never find these things like all clustered together and having ampicillin resistance on all these man-made signatures in the wild. SARS-CoV-2 doesn't have any of that, so it's not man-made. However, let's go one step further. I promise you will end after this. Let's go one step further. Um, the fact that we could find close matches in wild bats and a 99% match in the receptor binding domain of wild pangolins refutes the idea of it being man-made further. Um, but let's go further. Let's say that humans designed it entirely from the ground up. First of all, this is ridiculous. Um, and I'm going to give you an analogy right here. Take a graffiti artist. Does a graffiti artist say, I want to graffiti something. Therefore, I'm going to build a house from the ground up. I'm going to build a wall from the ground up. They don't say that. Similarly, scientists don't say, I'm going to build an entire viral genome from the ground up. We take things that naturally occur in the wild and modify them. Um, and that results in human signatures. Um, similarly, the graffiti artist will modify a pre-built wall. Or in my case, my U-Haul van when I moved to Seattle. Um, I love U-District. I love the Ave. Um, don't know why that happened, but I found it interesting. Um, I believe it says no ears, but I'm not sure. Um, so this begs the question, uh, why did conspiracies not happen for SARS and MERS? Why did they not happen for Ebola? Well, it didn't happen as bad for Ebola. Well, first of all, SARS-CoV-2 is a global pandemic that was not contained. It is on another level, on another scale than SARS and MERS, which were contained. And also, the proximity to the Wuhan market, um, to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. They're a couple miles away, and it's easy for people to piece that together. Oh, lab, food market, it must have been the, the virology lab. And that's not supported. Um, and also. 
this unfortunately is the case for a lot of the conspiracy theories is stereotypes around Chinese scientists. Um, I don't know, but a few years ago, a Chinese scientist used CRISPR-Cas9. We should definitely cover CRISPR-Cas9. Um, the woman uh, responsible for that at Berkeley recently got the Nobel Prize for it. But uh, he used CRISPR-Cas9 to genetically engineer human babies to be HIV resistant. And it was sketchy as hell. Like, it was, it violated ethical concerns. He got in a lot of trouble, and I think he got discredited by pretty much everyone. But it created a stereotype around Chinese scientists not following ethical standards. Um, and also, I don't know for, about you, but there's a lot of racism towards Chinese and Asian people right now in the current environment that we live in. Um, personally, I think that's propagated by social media and fake news. It, it's everywhere. I spend hours of my day on my phone looking through Twitter and Facebook and seeing all these clickbait articles. If you go to PolitiFact, you can see that the majority of uh, coverage regarding coronavirus is actually either half true or false. And this is just so damaging towards uh, pandemic control and epidemiology. Lastly, there's a lot of stigma around scientists as a whole. Um, people outside of science, like my dad, view us as like mad scientists, Frankensteins that could be uh, viewed as mad scientists and doing all these crazy experiments. Um, and this is not the case for the majority of scientists, but they're stigmatized. Real quick, um, this paper was released in March. We have SARS-CoV, MERS-CoV, and SARS-CoV-2. You know, it's a big increase. But just for fun, I decided to graph it recently. Um, this was made in March 21st. And you could already see that SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV are nothing compared to SARS-CoV-2. And I decided to graph it today. And like, here it is. So SARS-CoV-2, February 10th, nothing. It's exploded exponentially. And this huge, uncontainable pandemic has bred a lot of the conspiracy theories because it's not controlled and it's just so predominant in our media. Um, so that's it for the presentation. I have some final questions and some conclusions. So. First question, how did the receptor binding domain evolve to bind to human ACE2 in pangolins? Seems like a weird question. How did it evolve in pangolins to bind to a human receptor? Um, and uh, here's an ethical question. Can we as American researchers trust Chinese researchers? Um, lastly, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic will strengthen or stigmatize science? Um, feel free. Hopefully I didn't uh, overwhelm you with the science of the coronavirus genome, but feel free to answer these questions. I guess just to take a stab at it, I'd say uh, I'll just go for the maybe middle que question. I think it's a I, idea. Ideally, I think we should be able to. It's almost the question is we can't. A lot of scientists don't or the public doesn't trust American scientists. And then, so it creates a different stigma that if we can't trust each other, how do we trust people in a different nation at it, like kind of at an opposing rate? But like, as I just, I'd say in general, absolutely, we can trust Chinese scientists because there's also a lot of amazing research coming out of there. Just And one person doesn't set the precedent. Absolutely. And I think we have to, to prevent pandemics like this from happening, we have to collaborate where the diseases originate. And right now they're in Chinese markets. Um, so we have to collaborate with their scientists to see how to prevent this. I also think another thing involved is that politics come into a lot of play with research. So oh, yeah. maybe here there's a lot of misinformation by our political, like, or our government. And in China, um, like there's a lot of, like propaganda and so they're very selective about what kind of information is 
released. And so I think um, that it would be like, we should trust Chinese researchers, but I think that there's a bit of limitation just from politics. Agreed. And I do think we should hold others to standards. So hold people to ethical standards, hold people to sanitation standards, because I don't want someone in their basement like communicating their science, doing this uh, all on their own. Um, so we have to hold people to higher standards, but we should trust other uh, researchers from around the world. I could give you a hint on the first question. Um, I don't know if this has been done before, but with the original uh, SARS-CoV, they found uh, protein homology. So what that means is that uh, even though humans and cats or humans and pangolins are two different species, we can have very similar proteins. We're all mammals. Um, and if we have similar ACE2 structure, then you can get something that's similar in pangolins that can infect humans as well. So we should look at protein homology. Um, Last question. That's a tough one. Will this strengthen the scientific community? I mean, we're going to be affected by this, but for the rest of our lives, if we go into science, um, do you think it's going to strengthen or politicize and stigmatize science? If it is like eventually like solved this problem, uh, then it will be like strengthened. <laughs> but if this problem just goes on and on, it probably will be stigmatized. Agreed. Yeah, I think it might also be a matter of how like, or politics are, is really kind of driving the, uh, the conversation right now. So if you have a uh, leader who is pro-science uh, and is listening to the scientists on things, then li and likely, and if they're successful, well, then, uh, you know, science will hopefully be strengthened and destigmatized. But if a leader continues to uh, kind of lambast and uh, not listen to scientists at all, then it's and it, it's just going to discredit it in the minds of people who trust that person. Or it's just if it, it'll be a snowball effect. Yeah, um, I had a theory that this might uh, strengthen science within the scientific community. So scientists generally like to trust each other and rely and cite each other. So you've seen like a big uh, collaboration between scientists to help combat this pandemic. However, in the general public with people who haven't taken science courses, this might seem intimidating and very foreign to them. Um, and it may stigmatize it, unfortunately. And I think the worst possible thing that we could do right now is release a vaccine that it doesn't work. Um, so the vaccine process has been sped up. And I believe this has been done safely. But if we do something like Russia and put a vaccine out there that hasn't even been through phase three clinical trials, that's largely unproven, and it turns out to be ineffective or even harmful, the anti-vax movement is going to go nuts. And I don't want that to happen. Um, we really need to take our time to make sure that we have a vaccine that is capable of making us immune to COVID-19. And I think the worst case scenario is that somebody messes up the va vaccine. That is the worst case scenario for science right now. Um, if anyone wants to give a crack at it, this is your chance before I move on. I mean the first question. Any question? Yeah. Um, wait, is this solved? I I was thinking people might, uh, I don't know, in fact, the pangolins with like SARS, like viruses, and then like it evolved in in them. Also, but, like, like that that doesn't sound like. <laughs> The opposite direction. I mean, it might happen. I yeah. hear, I don't know if this is true, but I hear articles about COVID-19 affecting other mammals like dogs. Um, 
I haven't researched that, so don't trust me on that one. If someone wants to uh, present like all the species that coronavirus can infect, feel free to. Um, we have that coming up. But yeah, I heard of like viruses is fine is found in like dog, yeah. but it doesn't make them feel sick or something. That's weird because yeah. like different species like bats. Bats could live with coronaviruses their whole life, and they're fine with it. Humans, <laughs> I mean, humans, once they get old, they really start to suffer from this stuff. Um, conclusion time. So bats naturally carry coronaviruses that can spill over into other animals and eventually into humans. SARS-CoV-2 affects, infects uh, humans uh, via their ACE2 receptor in the epithelial lung cells. And the receptor binding domain for SARS-CoV-2 is most similar to uh, pangolin. It doesn't mean it's uh, exclusively from pangolin. You can get a viral recombination event to result in SARS-CoV-2. But right now, the, the receptor binding domain has all six crucial amino acids. And uh, we are currently sequencing more and more coronaviruses to track the evolutionary history of SARS-CoV-2. I read some article about uh, China digging up old blood samples and stuff to see if they could detect uh, SARS-CoV-2 in like samples from 2018, 2019, and previous, before the pandemic, um, prior to pa the pandemic. Um, and lastly, take off your tinfoil hat because SARS-CoV-2 was not made in a lab. Hopefully I convinced you of that. The whole idea of that is kind of ridiculous. Um, all the situations point to it occurring in the wild and transferring it over to humans. Um, so here's where we talk about future ideas. Um, if you have any ideas, send them in the chat. And more importantly, if you want to stick around and talk about the next journal club, it's, done, it's being done on a volunteer basis. So if anyone wants to present, if you have like an interesting paper in mind, if you have an interesting topic in mind, um, let me and the journal club chairs know because you can present and uh, we'll record this and post it to our YouTube channel and you could have something to put on your resume. Um, but uh, here are our social media accounts. Um, does anyone have any suggestions, any interesting research they want to share? <laughs>